So if you have your Bibles, you want to turn there with me to Romans chapter 11. And we're going to look at what Paul gives in this chapter is four responsibilities of the body of Christ toward the Jewish people. And I know this isn't our first time here. I know you, you all are a group who know and love Jewish people, know and believe with us that they need to be saved through Yeshua, the Messiah. But I think this text is important, and it's just a good reminder. And in it is the gospel, and, and that's always a good reminder for us too, isn't it? So we're going to look at four responsibilities of the body of Christ toward the Jewish people. And if you're taking notes, uh, they are this. First, it's to make Israel jealous. Second, we ought to have an attitude of gratitude. Third, we need to understand God's perspective. And fourth, we are to be mercy bearers. So, with that in mind, let's uh, dive in to, uh, to Romans 11. But before I do, let me just pray and ask God to, to speak to our hearts this morning. Father, I, I want to invite you to uh, make your word alive to us. Anything that I say this morning that's not of you, throw it to the wayside. We need you to speak to our hearts. We need your word to convict us. And you know what each person here needs to hear from you. And may they do that. We bless you and thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So before we look at Romans 11, and this is a really key text uh, in the whole book, in the whole Bible, just a little bit of background to, uh, to the book of Romans. Um, in the early church, Jews and Gentiles were worshiping together. You know, the predominant, uh, predominantly it was Jewish people who came to faith in Jesus, and finally Gentiles started to get the gospel, and they said, wow, this is amazing, this is a good thing. They have the Holy Spirit just like we do. And so in the church in Rome, there were Jews and Gentiles worshiping together. Paul had written this, this letter in part to tell the Gentiles, inform them how to relate to their Jewish brothers and sisters. Like, I know this is a weird group of people for you all in Rome, these Jewish people of mine, Paul would say. He says, but I want to tell you how to, how to relate to them. I want to give you some instructions on God's perspective, on, on what their role is, what your role is, and, and how, do you do, how do you come together as one. So that's what he, what he wants to write in this book. And the whole theme, if we could narrow it down to, to one word, the theme of Romans, gospel. It's a gospel book, and I love it. Chapter 1, God reveals uh, that himself to every person through creation. So, no one is without excuse to know God because he's revealed himself to us. Uh, 125 says that we exchange God's glory for things of uh, created things and we worshiped creation rather than the creator. And all of us have done that. Even today, we, we tend to worship idols instead of the one true God. And then Romans 3.23 says that all of us have sinned Jew and Gentile, and we fall short of the glory of God. We can't make it to him on our own anymore because of sin. We needed an intervention. Ro Romans chapter 5 through 7 tells the story of, of and, and really the theology of how Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He came down from heaven. Uh, he was the perfect payment for our sin. And in, instead of our sin, he gives us his righteousness, this glorious exchange, our sin for his glory, for his righteousness. And that's the gospel, isn't it? It's the good news of what God has done and is doing through the work and person of Jesus, his death and resurrection on the cross, offering forgiveness of sins to all who believe, trust, and follow Jesus. Amen? 
and he invites us to lay down our life, invite him to be Lord and King of our lives, and to follow him every day. That is the gospel. And it never gets stale. It never gets old. Chapter 8, Paul wants to tell us how God is faithful. And we have such amazing verses, you know, nothing in all of creation will separate us from the love of God. God Paul wants to establish God's faithfulness and we come to Romans chapter 9, 10 through 11, and Paul wants to show God's faithfulness to Israel. He wants to demonstrate God's faithfulness by showing us how he does it to Israel. Because if God was faithful to Israel, to Jewish people, he'll be faithful to us. If God kept his promises to the Jewish people, we'll know he will keep his promises to us. And uh, chapters 9 through 11 are just so key, and if you haven't read them, I'd encourage you to, uh, to read them straight through. And we come to chapter 11. And um, again, I think Paul lays out four responsibilities to the body of Christ, how we should relate and act toward my Jewish people. So first of all, Paul says in Romans 11 that we are to make Israel jealous. Look at Romans chapter 11, verse 11. Again I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? No, not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. Or some translations say, to make Israel jealous. Now, it's an interesting verse. Uh, you know, I, I, I love to tell people this because it's a very simple responsibility. Just make Jewish people jealous. Right? What does that mean? How do I do that? Well, uh, read on in verses uh, 13 and 14. Paul even talks about his own experience, how he does that. He says, I am talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I make much of my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of, some of them. Paul was the missionary to the Gentiles, and yet he says he made much of his ministry to make his people jealous. In every city he went to, where did he go first? To the synagogue that he may reach his Jewish people. So we're called as the body of Messiah to make Jewish people envious, jealous. Of what? Maybe the better question is, of who? Of who's living inside of you? Now there's two things I think about this. H how do we do this? One, we must make it attractive. Right? I mean, if the Jesus that people see in you is, is a frumpy, grumpy, complaining Christian, no one's going to want that Jesus. You know, it's been said people don't read their Bibles anymore, they read their Christians. People don't read their Bibles anymore, they read their Christians. Beloved, they're looking at you and I, and they're saying, is this what it means to follow Jesus? The question is, when people look at our lives, are we making it attractive? No, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying put on a, a plastic face and, and be fake. But, you know, when we want something from somebody else, you know, ha haven't you ever, uh, maybe your neighbor got a new car and you see it coming out of the driveway, they just washed it, it's all sparkly, you know, you wash the rims, the tires are even glimmering at you, and you think, wow, a brand new car. You open the doors, it has that new car smell, you know? You know what I'm talking about. You're like, man, what I, wouldn't, what I wouldn't give for that car. I would love that car. Now your other neighbor has an old beater from the 1980s. He hasn't washed it in years. No one is thinking, oh my goodness, I really want that car. 
<laughs> right? We must make it attractive. We must make the gospel something that people want. We must make Jesus and the abundant life that he told us to live something that people should want. And if it's not being lived out in our lives, no one's going to be jealous for what we have. Secondly, I think it has to work. It must be attractive, but it also must work. Nobody wants something of somebody else that doesn't work. Who wants that? You know, like, I have two kids, two small children, and, and whenever one of them is playing with something, you know, and the other one wants it. Why? Because they're having fun. It's working. The toy is working. It's, they're having fun. And so the other child wants to take it from them because they want it to work for them. They want to have fun with the toy. Is Jesus working in your life? I mean, is the gospel working its way in your life? Or are people looking at us and saying, if that's what following Jesus is, I don't want to have any part of it. But this is a responsibility, Paul says, is of the body of Christ to make Israel, the Jewish people, envious of the Jesus that is in our lives the Spirit is working in our lives, producing fruit, and it's attractive. I mean, you've heard stories, haven't you, of people who came to faith and they said, I just, that person had something I wanted. They had a joy that I wanted. They had a peace that I've never seen. It was attractive and it worked. So we ought to make Israel jealous. Secondly, Verses 17 to 20, Paul says that we need to have an attitude of gratitude. Verses 17 to 20. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not boast over those branches. If you do consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. What's Paul saying here? Without going into real detail about this analogy he's using, uh, branches olive branch and roots, Paul is basically saying to them, you have salvation because Jewish people rejected Jesus and he was able to go to you. He's using this picture of, a, of an olive tree, which is representative of the people of God. And it's a natural, it's a, a wild olive tree some of the branches were cut off. Uh, maybe you know something more about agriculture and botany m than I do, but you can actually merge two different kinds of trees together. It's sort of like this a new creation uh, of a tree, and, and you can cut off some branches and stick some different ones on, and, and it just kind of, the, the, the sap goes through the branches as if it were part of the original tree. The original tree is, is Israel, God's people. The roots, Paul says, don't boast over the branches because you don't support the root, you're the branch. The root supports the branch. What are the roots, Paul says? Well, previously in, in earlier chapters in Romans, he tells us that the roots are the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. The roots are the scriptures that God gave the Jewish people. The roots are the prophets and the priests. Those are the foundation of our faith in Jesus, aren't they? They're the foundation of the Hebrew scriptures, which are the foundation of the new covenant. So because some of the branches, the Jewish unbelievers who rejected Jesus, because they were cut off and you were grafted in, to this crazy looking tree now. Don't boast over the branches that were cut off. 
don't think you're better because now you're in and they're out. Be grateful. Be grateful. Don't boast. Be grateful. And as Paul hints at, a, at a, our third point in a minute, he says that if they were broken off so you could become in, how much easier will it be for these natural branches to come back in once they repent? Amen? So have an attitude of gratitude. Uh, look at verse 28. He expounds on this. As far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs, for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. God loves his Jewish people. He hasn't rejected them, as we'll see. He, he hasn't forgotten about them. He loves them. He loves them so much that he used their rejection of Jesus so that salvation and the gospel can go to the uttermost parts of the world. Think about it. This morning, there are African believers praising God in their native tongue. There are Christians in Korea, in many tribes in New Guinea, in all the outer, words, uh, outer parts of the world, all because God in his sovereignty chose to cut some of those natural branches off. So be grateful. You have the scriptures because of the Jewish people. You have salvation ultimately because my people said no temporarily. Have an attitude of gratitude. And remember that the root supports you. Amen? A lot of people think that because we have the New Testament and the church, it's sort of a, they wouldn't describe it this way, but it's really a flipped up tree, upside down tree. They say, it's the Old Testament. It doesn't matter anymore. It's the old people of God. They don't matter anymore. We're the new people of God. Paul says, don't boast. Don't boast. Be grateful. So first, Paul tells us to have, uh, to have this ministry of making Israel jealous. Then he says, be, have an attitude of gratitude. Be grateful for what the Jewish people gave to you. The Messiah, the scriptures. Thirdly, Paul wants us to have an understanding of God's perspective. Understand God's perspective. Look at verse 11. Um, and, and part of this, to having God's perspective, is to know why he allowed the rejection of Jesus by the, his, his chosen people, his Jewish people. First of all, the Israel's rejection was not hopeless. Look at verse 11. Again, did I ask, did they stumble so, so as to fall beyond recovery? Did they trip up so bad that they're not going to get back up again? Did they reject Jesus so badly that there's no hope for them to receive him? Not at all. And actually in the Greek, it's a lot more strong, strongly worded language than that. Absolutely not, Paul says. It was not hopeless, their rejection of Jesus. Part B is to say, that Israel's rejection was not total. Uh, look at verse 1 in chapter 11. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. And then Paul goes on to say, why? That's true. Because there has always been a remnant. A remnant is a small group of people who have always believed and followed the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Most of our, my history, uh, uh, our history of the Jewish people has been not following God. I mean, Moses came down from the mountain, and what were we doing? We were already breaking 
the first commandment. We were having a party with a little golden calf. But there have always been a remnant. Paul says himself, he is this part of this remnant. My wife, myself, Jeremiah Parecki, we are part of this remnant. Jews who believe in Jesus are the current remnant of, the, of Israel. By the way, that's, that's one of the examples I give to people, especially Jewish atheists I talk to, who say they don't believe in God. I say, if, we, if God did not exist, you and I would not be identifying ourselves as Jewish today. There would be no state of Israel if there was no God of Israel. So, Israel's rejection of Jesus was not total. In other words, it wasn't everybody, although it was on a national level. As we know, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 Jewish people came to faith in Jesus. They were the first fruits. All the first believers to believe in Jesus were all Jewish. And for the first couple hundred years, the majority of people were, were Jews who followed Jesus. So thirdly, Israel's rejection was not only not hopeless, it's not total, it's also not final. Look at verses 12 and 14. But if their transgression, their rejecting God, means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will, the, will their fullness bring? For if, and then verse, verse, verse 15. For if their rejection is reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? What's Paul saying here? He's saying God is, uh, will bring his people back. If, if Israel's rejection of Jesus meant the whole world can hear about him, just think about what will happen when they receive receive him, when they accept him again. Paul says it's going to be like life from the dead. God is able to bring Israel back to himself. Look at verse 23. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. God's able. Amen? God's able to bring you into the tree. He's able to bring them back. And he's not only able, he will. And this is the great perspective that Paul wants us to understand. Verses 25 and 26. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in and so all of Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Did you notice the language there that Paul said? Israel has experienced a hardening in part. A hardening in part. God will bring his Jewish people back to him through faith in Jesus. And Paul describes it when that day comes when the number of Gentiles around the nations have come to faith in Jesus, and he says, okay, enough. It's now time for a Jewish revival. And he says, all of Israel will be saved. Amen? Through Jesus, not through their own ways, not through their good works, but through Jesus. It's this illustration, I see it like this. Israel is God's house. And... Um, God built the house and they were the first occupants. And, and when they saw Jesus, again on a national level, but not all of them, they opened the door and said, no thank you, I'm out. And they walked out. They walked out of God's house, but they left the door open so that you and you and you can walk in. Oh, the door's open, thank you. Thank you. They walk in the house. 
And why are you in the house, Paul says? Only to tell them and to shout at the streets, come on in. This is your house. I'm worshiping your Messiah. He's the Jewish Messiah. He came from your people. He came from your land. And it's your job to call my Jewish people back in the house, which they walked out of. And Paul says when they do, when they walk back in, when they come back into God's fold through faith in Jesus, it will be like life from the dead. Beloved, I believe a day is coming, and may it come in our day and age, where we will see a Jewish revival. We've seen a revival of all around the world but not like the Jewish people have. Actually, since the 1970s, more Jewish people have come to faith in the last 40 years than the previous 2000. It started, but, but it's, just a, it's just the drop, just the tip of the iceberg, what we're going to see. So it's important for us to understand God's perspective, to understand how and why God allowed his Jewish people to reject Jesus. So again, Paul says, your responsibility to make Israel jealous, to have an attitude of gratitude, be thankful that they allowed you in the house, have an understanding of God's perspective. Their rejection was temporary, it was in part, and it was for a purpose, to come back in again. And fourth, your final responsibility is to be mercy bearers. Look at verses 30 and 32. Just as you, who were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over to disobedience that he may have mercy on them all. That's powerful. You've received mercy because of my Jewish people's disobedience. And again, it's kind of like this boomerang effect. Why did you receive mercy? So that you can bring mercy to the Jewish people. Paul says, they too may now receive mercy. How? Verse 31 as a result of God's mercy to you. What does that look like? How could could Jewish people receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you? It's kind of like being uh, bearers of peace because of the peace that God gives to you. Or, Or earlier on, Paul says that God gives us comfort And we have to comfort others with the comfort we ourselves have. It it implies that we have to give it away. (laughs) If you are to bring mercy to people, you need to give it away. And you might ask yourself, well, how do I do that? How do I be a mercy bearer? How do the Jewish people receive mercy through the mercy that God's given me? I think there's three ways. First, through your witness. This is one of the most powerful ways. If you have the opportunity to talk to a Jewish person, maybe you know somebody, maybe an in-law who is, who is Jewish, you have an opportunity to show them mercy through you telling them about Jesus, telling them about your testimony, about what God has done for you, how he's delivered you out of Egypt. Through your direct witness through your love, your actions, and your words, you can be a mercy bearer to Jewish people. Maybe you think, okay, well, maybe I don't know any Jewish people. You can bring mercy to Israel, to Jewish people, through your prayers. I'm so grateful how many people newsletters and they read the stories of Jewish people I'm talking to and they say, yeah, I pray every day for the peace of Jerusalem. Amen. Pray also that the blinders would come off their eyes. The veil must come down. And it only is going to come down when God brings it down. You can bring mercy to Jewish people 
through praying for them, praying that God softens their hearts and removes the veil. And thirdly, you can bring mercy to Jewish people by continuing to partner with those of us like myself who are full-time missionaries and, and go out on the streets and do the phone calling. Do you understand? Do you realize how important your partnership is? Your prayers for us? You stand with us every time you pray. Every time you support us. That's what happens. You become a mercy bearer because of your partnership with us. That's your responsibility. It, I hope it's not too daunting. I hope it's an encouragement to you because we look forward to that day when all of Israel will be saved and you can know that you're a part of it, that you stand with us to that end. So my question this morning to you, <clears throat> are you accepting God's invitation? Are you accepting his invitation to participate with him in his plan? his end-time salvation plan for Jewish people? Have you allowed him to work in your life? Have you given him free reign? If you haven't, this morning, invite God to be your king again. Let's pray. Father, speak to your people. Give us a vision of this end time plan. Give us a heart, if we don't already have it, to pray for your Jewish people that they might come to saving faith through Jesus Messiah. Because without them, like any other people, they are lost. Lord, I pray that you'd show each person here this morning how they can be involved, how they can be your hands, your feet in this great plan of yours. And Lord, let us take your responsibility seriously. Thank you that you've let us in the door and the door is still open for Israel today. Show us what we must do. In Jesus' name.